The 2013-15 biennial budget introduces a raft of spending cuts to public schools that will result in no raises for teachers, larger class sizes, fewer teacher assistants, little support for instructional supplies or professional development, and what could amount to the dismantling of the North Carolina Teaching Fellows Program. Teachers can also say goodbye to tenure and supplemental pay for advanced degrees. As public education tries to provide high quality educational services, for all of its students in the face of these severe cuts, lawmakers have simultaneously introduced a way out for those who can take advantage, that is, school vouchers. So what are we to make of these changes? What's next for our schools? Today, we're going to explore the answers to these and other related questions with one of the state's most knowledgeable experts on the subject, North Carolina Superintendent of Public Instruction, Dr. June Atkinson. Dr. Atkinson has more than 35 years of experience in education. And during her career, she has served as a chief consultant and director in the areas of business education, career and technical education, and instructional services within DPR. A former business education teacher, Dr. Atkinson has been involved in instruction and curriculum development throughout her career. And she is also, of course, the first woman elected state superintendent of the public schools of North Carolina and has served in that position since August of 2005. And throughout her tenure in office, she has been a vocal and passionate defender of our public schools and and we're delighted to have her today. Well, good afternoon to all of you. Pleasure to be here to have a crucial conversation about public education in North Carolina. And I think it's very fitting for all of you to look at my microphone. <laughs> uh, you'll notice that it has a paper clip because the actual clip from the microphone fell. And so that really epitomizes where our schools are today. They're going to have to do a lot of improvising when it comes to helping students this year because of the situation we face as a part of the budget. But it really is important to have an honest conversation about where we are, the context, and what it means for our one and a half million children that we have in our, in our state. And I want to just give you a little context uh, about an aha moment that I had about five years ago. I heard a Harvard professor talk about how that there had been an increased attention to teachers in the media. And he talked about how that uh, in the 1980s and the 1990s, you rarely read articles about teachers. And then all of a sudden, there were all of these articles in the paper and in the news media about teachers and the condition of public education. And that was an aha moment for me because it gave me an unsettling <clears throat> feeling about the support for public education and the, the uh, race to capture the public opinion about public education. So one Saturday afternoon when I was cleaning my kitchen, I'd taken a break from knitting. <laughs> I heard this beautiful blonde commentator on national television talk about how bad our teachers are and how we were failing our students and the only way that we could ever get to a better place in the United States with education is that we needed to look to the private sector. And actually, I was appalled by that statement because I spend a lot of time in schools across North Carolina, and what she described as non-caring teachers, uh, I wasn't seeing in our state. And yet, I saw that mantra, schools are broken, get momentum, and more momentum. And I heard it over and over again, and you've heard it over and over again. And so as we move forward uh, since that time to the present, I can really categorize people in two groups, although there are variations of these groups. And one is, let's privatize education. Let the market take care of education. And that will get us to a better place. And then I hear other people say that let's improve our schools. They are, uh, they are improving, but we need to continue to change. We need to improve our schools. And also, I hear as a part of that conversation for those who support public education, that public education really is the great equalizer. And it's the essence of our having strong economic growth. And it's the essence of our having educated people 
and it's the essence of our having a high standard of living. And so, to me, there was a huge dis or there has been a huge disconnect between people talking about how bad schools are compared to where we have been. For example, and you'll hear me say this almost every time I speak, that our dropout rate is the lowest it has ever been in our state since we've been keeping records for a long time. And our high school graduation rate has continued to improve to this past year of 82.5%. That's almost 83%, so I'm saying 83%. And then, thank you, Tom. And then when you look at where we've been, when we had a graduation rate of 68% and we've gone from 68% to over 82%, uh, and we've seen that our teachers over and over again over the past 12 to 15 years have accepted higher standards. They have accepted higher standards when it comes to testing. And each time the tests become more rigorous, we see a drop in our testing scores, but then we see a bump up and they continue to grow. And our teachers have been among the biggest supporters of our moving to the Common Core, which are rigorous standards that will help our students. And then we see that we were among the, um, the states and industrialized uh, countries taking TIMS, a measure of international mathematics and science standards. And this past year, North Carolina was ranked among the top 11 in the world. And repeat after me, she said world, not the United States. So there's such a disconnect. And at the same time, we, pe we, see, we hear people say that kids can't read, write. Uh, they come to the workplace and they don't know how to do anything. Well, that's been a criticism since 1807. <laughs> but nevertheless, our students last year earned over 91,000 credentials. Credentials that are recognized, developed, and sanctioned by business and industry in our state and in the United States. So I see this progress, and at the same time, I hear people saying that our schools are broken. Well. The other important part about that is an article that I encourage all of you to read in Education Week. It was published in October 2012. And that article states that since the 1970s, as measured by the nation's report card, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, our, we have had a constant increase in our achievement of, of students in mathematics and reading. But at the same time, the public opinion of schools has dropped each of those years. So why is that? Why is it that as a whole, we're doing better in education than we ever had, and at the same time, public opinion is dropping? Is it because there is a concerted effort to privatize public education in our state? Is it that our public schools do not have a public relations communication budget that would allow our schools to share the good stories? I'll leave that for your uh, decision. But then we have the backdrop of how we got to this budget that we have today. And it reminds me of the time when I was in my late 20s and I was trying to sell my gray Chevrolet Impala. <laughs> I desperately needed a new car. I had two tires that were in bad shape. I had two tires that were in good shape. The car had a vinyl top. Do any of you remember vinyl tops? <laughs> well, the vinyl top was faded, but it had a good paint job. So I take my car to the dealership to ask for a good value for my car so that I would have a good down payment to buy another. So I arrive, the salesperson comes out, says, what may I do to help you? And I said, well, I want to trade in my car so I can buy a new Honda. And he said, well, let's look at your car to see how much it's worth. And he looked at the tires and he said, we've got two uh, ball tires. And I said, yes, but I've got two good tires on the front. <laughs> And he said, well, the vinyl top is faded and it will have to be replaced. I said, oh, but look at this paint job that this car has. 
Well, the moral of that story is that he did not offer me the value that I wanted for that car. And he did not give me the value I needed in order to have a substantial down payment for a Honda. That's the way I look at the budget that we have. We do not have a substantial down payment in the education of our one and a half million children that we have in our state. No matter how much people want to paint a rosy picture of our budget situation. And one way to look at that is to look where we were in the year 2009. In 2009-11 school year, our teachers did not have any salary increases. They took a furlough days. Uh, teacher and teacher assistant positions were eliminated while class sizes were lifted in the upper grades. Funding for professional education was eliminated. Now think of that. The growing, the learning community of educators, we did not get any dollars for professional development and we haven't gotten a dime since from the General Assembly. We also had appropriations for textbooks and supplies to be reduced. Now teachers, I thought, were very kind during that time because they recognized that our state was facing very difficult economic times and they were willing to tighten their belts, they were willing to deal with uh, larger class sizes. They were, although it wasn't a nice thing, they were willing to share some textbooks. They dealt with having more uh, teachers, I mean students in the classroom as you have just seen. But then we had a problem, but that problem being amplified because during that time we had more and more students enrolling in public education. And, but at the same time, the state funding did not, did not increase. Now, we were fortunate that we did get, during that time, the Federal American Recovery and Investment Act dollars, which, which took the place of some of the cuts. And I bet if I said one time, I said a million times, North Carolina needs to prepare itself for the funding cliff that we are going to face. <coughs> Now, we have it. And then, we were also fortunate to get $400 million from Race to the Top. And thank goodness for $400 million from Race to the Top, because that has been our only source, for the most part, for professional development. It's been the only source of dollars where our, student, our teachers can learn about more rigorous standards. And it's been uh, the a good source for our students, I mean for our schools, to move to the use of technology. So when we approached the 2011-2013 year, we had some hope that the state would make a stronger investment in public education. And unfortunately, it did not. And during that time, many of our superintendents said such things as, uh, we have used federal dollars to try and limp through the past two or three years, but we cannot continue to limp. And that was our, st our local <coughs> superintendent, Kathy Spencer, from Onslow County. And then Mike Gracie, who's the superintendent in Jones County, really epitomized the situation that we were in now and where we were headed then. And he said that we are at a time now where things are like a rubber band. You keep stretching, stretching, and stretching, and eventually it pops. So the big question is, how did the budget of 13-15 work for us? It's unfortunate <clears throat> that the budgets passed and signed by the governor does little to correct the downward spiral that we are facing in public education and what we have witnessed over the past five years. Now we can divide education funding into two camps, people and stuff. And when I say people, I'm talking about our teacher assistants, our teachers, the people who, the adults who are in the building. And the stuff would be such tangible items as textbooks, digital textbooks, supplies. But it can also be technology and professional development. Well, when you look at the people category, the facts are clear. There are fewer adults in North Carolina public schools than there were six years ago. There are fewer adults in our public schools today than they were six years ago. However, we have 33,000 more students. 
Now think about that for a moment. We have 33,000 more children with more diverse needs. We have children who are more children living in poverty and they're served by fewer educators, fewer teacher assistants, fewer student nurses, counselors, and even fewer staff in the local district office. Now, according to a survey that we conducted, local school districts have eliminated 17,278 positions from the year 2008 to 2012. And they have eliminated 6,178 public school people who lost their jobs during that time. So that was the starting point for 1314. And it is important to remember that for several years, the school districts had a discretionary cut. Any of you know what a discretionary cut is? A few of you. What it means is that, uh, in simple terms, I tell you, let's pretend all of you are my children. And I say to you, I'm going to give you a, an allowance of $50 for this coming year. And then I give you the money. And then I say, oh, by the way, I want $10 of that back. And you have to figure out how you're going to spread that $40 over the things that you were going to do with that money. Well, that's a discretionary cut. Now, one thing about the discretionary cut is that it took the blame from the General Assembly to local school districts. So General Assembly members, and this is a technique that's been used by all parties, it, it took the blame, well, we didn't cut teacher assistance. We didn't cut teachers. It, the, that horrible superintendent in your school district or that hor horrible local uh, board of education, and I can't understand why they would do that. And that argument has been, as I said, been used by all parties. And so if I could think of one good thing in the budget this year is they did rid the budget of the discretionary cut, and there's more truth in budgeting, but this budget eliminates about 5,200 teaching positions. It, the funding for teacher assistance has been reduced by 21%, or approximately, and it depends on how school districts deal with this, approximately 4,600 teaching assistance, and for our counselors, our media coordinators, it, we have a reduction of 270 positions. So they're the people. Now let's go to the stuff. How many of you own a Kindle or a Nook? Well, how much does it cost for you to download a book to your Kindle or Nook? $14? 99 cents. 99 cents? <laughs> They're the classics. <laughs> well, think about this. Our textbooks, whether they're digital or whether they're hard copy, range in cost from $35 to $86 per book. And at the same time, this budget has $15 per student for textbooks. So you compare $15 to 35 to $86, then you can see why parents may say, my child doesn't have a digital textbook or a textbook. Because in order to use a digital textbook, you need to have some kind of a device in order to read a digital textbook. And then, let's look at instructional materials and supplies. That has been cut by more than half in, from 2008 to 2013-14. In other words, we've gone from about $59 for instructional materials per student to $29 per student. And the other day, and I know some people are in here the other night, I should say, there was a TV program. Um, and there were a lot, uh, a town hall meeting, and there were, the place had many teachers. And the question was asked, how many of you as teachers buy supplies for your students? And every hand in that room went up. And then I think back to last year, I was having dinner with strangers, and one of the men um, said, you know, my daughter is a teacher, and she asked me for money to buy supplies for her classroom. So I think 
what our students and what our teachers will be facing this year. But what happened in the budget was that those cuts during the bad times for textbooks and for instructional materials were supposed to be just a one-time cut. Not in this budget, they became a permanent part of the budget cuts. And then let's just talk about teachers. Think about how important teachers are. And when you take care of teachers, you really are taking care of the one and a half million children that we have in our state. Because we know that next to parents, or next to some parents, teachers have the greatest influence on our children. And parents want great teachers in the classroom. And how are we going to continue as a state to attract the brightest, the most caring, the best teachers in our state when we have a salary that is among the lowest in the nation, 46? And isn't it a shame that we've made an investment in our teachers through their education for them to turn around and go to Virginia to make $10,000 more or go to Tennessee or South Carolina, that is a shame. And then when you think that our salary schedule has been frozen, seems like forever. In, some, in fact, some of our teachers don't even remember when you advance one year uh, to another salary. But it takes 15 years for a teacher in North Carolina with a bachelor's degree to make $40,000. And it takes 35 years. I guess I would be at the top of the scale now. It would take 35 years for a, for a teacher to get at the top of the scale. So it is not a pretty picture when it comes to the way North Carolina is treating its teachers. The people we should value the most uh, when it comes to education. And you think, uh, in, eight, in 2008, a five-year teacher had a base salary of $35,000, uh, $380. In 2013, a five-year teacher had a base salary of $31,220. So five years, $35,000 uh, in 2008-09, and a base of $31,220 in 2013. That is so sad. It is so sad for the, hundred and, for the thousands of teachers we have, but even more importantly, it is so sad for the 1.5 million students that we see. And yet, our teachers are resilient. They maintain their enthusiasm for what they're going to do for students. And in the past week, I've been to Warren County, Pamlico County, uh, Beaufort County, and to a charter school. And all of the teachers at those schools were saying, we just want to do the best we can for our kids this year. But I am worried about making ends meet. And then to add insult to injury, the General Assembly said that teachers with master's degrees, effective 2014, would not be paid on a master scale, would not get a 10% bump in salaries. Wow of all industries in North Carolina, education should be about lifelong learning. And there's plenty of evidence to show that a master's degree in a teacher's um, field of study or a teacher assignment really makes a difference in uh, achievement of the students. And then my favorite <coughs> among all of the insults to public education in the budget is that of the voucher bill. And one thing that um, I've said this so much, I want to say it one more time, and that is the budget, the voucher bill uh, is to give parents uh, a choice of to go into a private school or going to a public school. Now, I respect parents who want to homeschool their children, who want to send them to private schools. But when you look at this, when you look at that legislation, there is no way to make comparisons. And so, as my grandmother would say, and Vanessa Jeter would not like me to say this, but it just summarizes the way I feel. The way that that bill is set up, we are asking parents to buy a pig and a poke. 
because there will not be any consistent measure. Now, as a teacher, I gave a lot of tests. As a student forever, I have taken a lot of tests. And all tests are not created equal. Right. And so in this voucher bill, it says that private schools receiving taxpayers' dollars shall give a standardized test. Well, my, my, my. <laughs> Standardized tests are not created equal. Right. So my point is, if our end of grade and end of course tests are good enough for our public school students, then they should be good enough for students going to private schools receiving taxpayers' dollars. <laughs> and if those tests aren't good enough, then why don't we use the same standardized test that a private school would use to determine reading or math achievement. It is important in this time that parents have the necessary information. And I thought it was a little sad when I heard a parent talk about the voucher bill and how that her child was, was at a, scored at a level two and she felt as if that with a tax voucher or tax credit, she would be able to have her child go to a private school and that child would excel at that private school because the class sizes would be lower. And then my next thought was, you know, she won't be able to talk about levels one, two, three, and four. She won't be able to make a comparison for that child. So that's why I think it's very important that we believe in public education and, tr and truth in how we're doing should push to say that we need the same standards. And someone said to me, aren't you afraid of what may be the results? Absolutely not. I have confidence in our teachers and, I, and if it turns out that a school, a private school receiving taxpayers dollars does better, then that's a place where we can go to learn a good lesson to help us with our other children. Well, it's not a pretty picture uh, of what we're facing, but I believe in North Carolinians, and I believe that our working together, that we can make some changes, and I would ask you to uh, push for these seven ideas, and I won't go into each one of them, but one is that we focus on preschool education and that we get more of our students in preschool education especially the most vulnerable, so that they will have a much better chance of being able to read at grade level. We need to give our teachers a raise, and we can't wait too much longer. We need to pay our teachers for master's degrees. We need to use our teacher evaluation system to help improve teacher skills and not a gotcha, and we should involve uh, peer observation, student survey, student growth with multiple years with multiple measures. We need, if the current legislation remains where, uh, where we have four-year contracts, then all teachers should be eligible for four-year contracts if they meet a, uh, a, a bar, rather than just saying 25%. And we need to fund technology so we can move closer to a personalized education for every child. And we need assistance in moving and transitioning from a, an assessment system where we take a snapshot at the end of the year to a system that will allow us to take a motion picture over time. And I have definitely run out of time, so I'm just stopping. <laughs>